Hello on Canvas. Thank you for joining our live discussion for AAPI Heritage Month hosted by the Canvas DEI Council. My name is Michael Chen and I will be your moderator for today's discussion. So I'm not I'm not here to talk about Prisma, Smart Sheet Team, so you can, you guys can all breathe a sigh of relief. I'm going to I'm here to have a very fun, very lively, very educational discussion with two incredible and aspiring leaders in the AAPI community. But before I bring our guests on, I wanted to talk about a few things our newly formed DI Council um, is doing. The DI Council is, uh, is comprised of individuals whose experiences and passions represent a wide range of perspectives with the goal of representing all voices at Canvas. The Council has been working with our DI consultant, Diverse City, to ensure that our policies and our practices are inclusive and impactful. So the month of May is AAPI Heritage Month, and I wanted to call out a few things Canvas has been doing in support of the AAPI community. With your help, Canvas matched $5,000 in donations to Stop AAPI Hate and Hate is a Virus, organizations that are committed to stopping hate crimes and combating racism towards the Asian American community. With this match, Canvas as a whole donated a total of $10,000 to these orgs. So we wanted to thank you for all your contributions. The DI Council is also starting an initiative to, to highlight API businesses in a company-wide newsletter at the end of the month. Thank you, thank you to all those who submitted a business. Well, that's, that's enough of me. I know you guys are not here to, um, to hear me talk. You guys, you guys hear that enough. So before we get started, before I bring our guests on, I wanted to, uh, just to let you guys know we will be holding the last 15 minutes for a Q&A session with, with our guests. So please feel free to submit your questions anytime there is, during, this, during this, this discussion in the Vimeo chat. So let's get started. I'm, I'm excited for this. I'm, I'm actually gonna bring down my notes because I need to get this. So our first guest that I'm gonna bring on is a creative director at RGA. She's an author, a speaker, and a mentor. She is the lead organizer at TEDx Culver City, a professor at Loyola Marymount University and General Assembly. She donates her time to several nonprofits such as Green World Campaign and the Lightbringer Project. She has contributed to several nonprofits such as, oh, I've read them. <laughs> she, has she has contributed to two books, Advertising by Design and Brand Cookies. She has also been featured on Think LA's Women of Color in Advertising. She is also the co-founder of Asians in Advertising. One Canvas, I'd like to introduce to you Bernice Chow. Hi, everyone. Thanks for having me. So our second guest is a learning and development director, DEI advocate, mentor, and people-oriented leader with over 10 years of combined experience across learning and development, diversity and inclusion, marketing, partnerships, business development, client management and consulting. She is a connector to who loves to cultivate learning cultures to allow those to thrive and seize potential with growth mindset. She is currently the president elect for the Association for Talent Development NYC. She is also a co-founder of Agents in Advertising. I'd like to introduce to you, Jessalyn Lamb. Hi everyone, happy to be here with all of you today. Thank you. Thank you guys for joining. Thank you guys for taking time. I know you guys, that whole speech, that whole intro just took me like five minutes to read. So I know you guys are busy. Yeah, thanks for that. Okay. Really complete. <laughs> there were a few more things. I left that out. I did not know that you completed an Ironman, Bernice. Oh yeah, that was a lifetime ago. But yeah, no, there was a time where I was really into endurance sports. <laughs> <laughs> And then I know Jessalyn, we've been talking about it, but we've been both going through some home renovations. So I know you don't really have that, that much time either. <laughs> so why don't, why don't we start with uh, telling, telling our guests a little bit about yourselves? Um, sure. Uh, so, you know, like you mentioned, I'm a creative director at RGA, um, California. I'm located out of Santa Monica. I previous job was at David and Goliath. So I'm very familiar with Canvas and the work that you guys, amazing work that you guys do. Um, I am also a mother of two. So I have a toddler and a three week old. So that's kind of my new my new thing that's going on. Yeah, not not too many Ironmans after that, right? <laughs> no. <laughs> <laughs> and 
Jessalyn? Sure. And for me, I, as it was already mentioned, I, I do learning and development at TBWA. And I also wanted to share that I created Omnicom's first Asian ERG called Omnicom Asian Leader Circle. I'm also the lead for TBWA's Asian ERG. And then there's an organization called the 3AF, which is Asian, it's Asian American Advertising Federation. And I'm on their next gen leaders committee where we launched a mentorship program. So those are the some of the extra things that I'm doing as well. Amazing. Just just a couple things. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so so why don't you tell us how how did you guys get your start in advertising? Um, I kind of go over kind of the quick version of it. Uh, I was always a fan of art. Uh, I decided to go into graphic design. I was at Art Center College of Design in Pasadena as a major in graphic design. And when I was exploring internships, the second internship I ended up getting was at TBWA Shiat Day, which is one of the big advertising agencies in Los Angeles. And without any advertising background or any interest in it, I kind of just learned on the job and really enjoyed it. I loved it and kind of just never left. And I'm now 16 years in. Um, and yeah, I love every single moment of it. I love the challenges, uh, problem solving, and just the creative direction and the people you get to work with. That's great. And and for me, I actually was always interested in art as well. So when I went to college, I minored in graphic design. And throughout my college experience, I ended up becoming the president of our AAF ch college chapter. And that was how I was able to discover the world of marketing and advertising. And I fell in love with it, just being able to meet the curious creative minds. And then my first advertising internship was at Wonderman, where I did account management there. And I just I loved it. Like it just became so amazing to be around the type of people and the amazing work that we do. So that's that's how I fell in love with the industry. That's great. That's great. Yeah, I know you meet so many incredible, so many creative people working in the in the industry. Uh, so can you guys uh, tell us just a little bit about your experiences as an API in advertising? You know, I think for me, it was kind of I didn't really realize how much being an AAPI impacted my journey um, until a couple of years in. Um, I think, you know, as a creative, I don't know about most creative departments, but every creative department I'm in, the percentage of women is very small. And then the minority percentage is even smaller. So most teams I'm on, I'm probably within the 5% in terms of female POCs. And I've never worked for female POC ever. Um, I've worked for a couple of POC men, um, but not many either. So I didn't realize how skewed it was until, you know, kind of reflecting on my own experience, probably about like seven years in, I was like, wait, I think there's a bias I'm happening. You know, a lot of this feedback I'm getting sounds really like, you know, like, for example, like, you know, during one of my reviews, I was told you need to speak up more. And no one that knows me would be like, oh, you don't speak up enough or you are shy or you don't give a piece of your mind. Like I'm very vocal, but I'm just not as mm -hmm. perceived as loud. Um, and I think that's because of my size, maybe the way I look. Um, I also started seeing that, you know, certain people would be invited to certain things. Like the person assigning the briefs would have basketball playing at their house in their backyard. But as a female, you're not, one that gets invited to that, you know, so it'd be like a special club and that club gets the premier briefs. And I started seeing that I was like, oh, wow, these are things that, you know, being who I am affects my career. So I would say that's kind of my experience being a API as a creative. I can, I can share mine. So I can even share that I grew up in Poughkeepsie, New York, and it was predominantly a white neighborhood. And when I moved to New York City for college, that was when I was exposed to just the diversity of people. And early on in my career, I worked for a company called Multicultural Marketing Resources. And that was an introduction early on in my career to the diversity, equity, and inclusion initiatives that all kinds of companies, including agencies, would lead. And I was introduced to organizations like Add Color, 3AF, Colorcom, and it opened a whole new world for me because I never really pictured myself thinking about these kind of initiatives. And ever since then, I really became a champion because I wanted to be part of the solution to change 
how we're how people of color are seen and how to how to be able to create opportunities for people like us. So it's it's definitely helped drive my passion and motivation to continue to to change it. Mm -hmm. So would you say that because I mean I feel I feel like I have a similar experience as as Bernice in a sense where I didn't really start to realize my I guess my my ethnicity <laughs> saying in, in the in the advertising industry until until a bit later on. Um, Bernice, what what would you say made you start picking up on these things? Well, it's like you know, I, with the couple of people that I could relate to, we start talking about you know, kind of mm. what things that they're going through and challenges. You know, I was talking to my friend where her partner who made the exact same work as her was getting paid more than her. Uh, and they were a pair, they were a creative pair. And I was like, and all the exact work. So it's like, how did one person get, you know, almost, you know, double right. salary just because it was a white man to an Asian female? Uh, you know, starting to hear these experiences where like, you know, I was told my ideas are cute and so is her, you know? And I was like, wait, you know, you couldn't say this to a man in the room. Uh, it's like, you have all these weird prejudices that happen where they're kind of like, you know, kind of these microaggressions that kind of happen where it's just like, you may be one of three Asians and they're confusing you for the other Asian and they think that's funny, you know? And you're mm -hmm. like, you're like, oh, am I yeah. the only person that's <laughs> offensive to this? And then you realize been talking to other people, it's like, no, that's not okay. Right. And that happens to more than just me, you know? That's an experience that's shared by a lot of people. And it's like, I think having those conversations and being open about, you know, kind of what's happening, you're like, oh, it's not just me. Oh, this is, maybe a racially motivated thing that people are doing subconscious bias. Mm -hmm. Thank you for sharing that. And and Jesslyn, it seems like from pretty early on in your career, you're pretty involved in sort of the multicultural, um, that sort of aspect of it. What, what would you say made you so interested in this starting out? Honestly, it, it was more that I was looking for a job and they were hiring <laughs> and it was early on in my career. And then when I started learning about it, it became something really fascinating to me. And I, I just started falling in love with it more of just like all the opportunities that we can create and being able to meet chief diversity officers and leaders who I still stay in touch with from when I met them early on in my career. So it's been amazing to see all the achievements that they've been able to make and collaborate with them. But even to share, like I, I've had, like being a API, like in the industry, I definitely have had negative experience as well. And I, I did want to share this because for, for anyone else that does experience this, like I've had this happen twice in my career where the entire team has been laid off except me. And then when I asked for like a raise because I was doing all the work for the team, they said that they didn't have a budget for it. And then a month or so later, they hire someone who's white. And that obviously is like a slap in the face and it being a API, it's like, it, it's definitely a red flag. And I like to, I've been sharing these kind of stories more because I want people to know the red flags when it comes to companies and be able to know to look for companies that will celebrate you because I'm very fortunate that I am in a current agency at TBWA that celebrates me. And that, that's something to be mindful of too, being API in the industry or just people of, of color where you have to make sure you find places that are not just hiring you to check it off the list, but are like really happy to like see you thrive and grow and be successful. That's great. So so what are, what are some tips that you can give to uh, just APIs in the industry that feel like they're being 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 overlooked or they're not being as appreciated as uh, as they would be or as, as they should be. You know, like Jessalyn said, recognize red flags, um, know that it's not OK and that if it doesn't get better, that it is OK to leave. I think so many times it's ingrained in us that, you know, we should be appreciative to have a job and that we're so lucky to be there instead of like, oh, no, that's not right. They need to treat me better. You know, I deserve better. Um, you know, of course, advocate for yourself. If that means asking for that raise, asking for that promotion and, you know, really making a stance on that, you know, and if that doesn't happen, you know, in the time frame or whatever they promised, or if they're not making those steps, um, know that you can leave. Um, there are other places that will support you. 
And, and to add to that, I would definitely say to look for mentors internally within your company and also externally as well. So even early on in my career, I joined an organization. It used to be called Advertising Woman of New York, and now it's called She Runs It. They have an incredible annual mentorship program that I was a mentee for for about six years. And it was just great to be able to meet other leaders in the industry who were able to give me advice, such as like negotiating my salary or getting a raise mm -hmm. and having those people to lean on to build. There's a term called like building your own personal board of directors. So you're having those mentors and different types of mentors to lean on for career advice throughout your journey. Yeah, I mean, I think at least in the beginning of my career, you know, you're so scared of what you don't know. So you're kind of, I was a little scared to find a mentor because I was like, oh, I'm so green. They're going to look down at me. Like, I, I don't even know how to ask for help. Um, I think, you know, changing the, your, the way that you kind of think about that. Um, I feel like other, like, you know, I was reading that white man, like in the industry will have three to four mentors, you know, and that's kind of one of the key successes of how they move up, um, you know, knowing that, you know, and kind of building that network for yourself is really important. So even if you're not part of these groups or you're not a mentee, you can always reach out on LinkedIn, uh, find people that you really admire. I always say the worst thing that they're going to do is just not answer you. And the best thing is they're going to connect you. Um, I, you know, mentioned that I've never worked for a female person of color. So I made it a thing to message at least 10 women that I saw on LinkedIn and just be like, hey, can we talk just because I've never worked with someone like you and I would love to learn from you. And I think eight of 10 responded. So, I mean, I highly recommend doing that. Definitely. And, and, and I totally relate to you guys too. I think it was kind of raised and ingrained in us to be, to be quiet, to be the hardworking ones, to be the ones that kind of are able to take the grunt of it, especially starting out in your career. You know, you want to get ahead and you want to, as as competitive as the space is, of the advertising industry is, you want to be the one who does the work and 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 you want to be seen as someone that can do the work. But uh, being able to be outspoken and kind of know your worth and show your worth is is a very important, very important uh, lesson lesson to have. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So you, I mean, you. Both, I mean, as you mentioned it before, you guys are pretty involved in 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 in, in organizations just beyond your your positions. How do how do you two know each other? So, you know, I think <laughs> I, I feel like you know one of the things that was great about the pandemic is there's so many great panels online, a lot of Zoom calls. Um, I attended one called Ascend Leadership. Is that correct, Jessalyn? And Jessalyn was there too. It was Ascend, like leaders in marketing. Yeah, and, it, and it's an organization. Um, you know, Jessalyn mentioned how much she kind of reaches out. She reached out to me and was like, hey, can we just talk? Um, she told me about her background and all this DNI work that she does. And I just thought she was amazing. Um, I always had the idea of creating an Asian an advertising group. Um, and meeting someone like her with all this experience and all this knowledge, I was like, would you be my co-founder? And so that's kind of how we started Asians in Advertising. Um, it's basically a free community with resources um, to help AIPIs in advertising to kind of ladder up and to network. And I'd love to add to that to even encourage everyone listening today. So when I attended the Ascend webinar, I love connecting with people. So I'm one of those people, if we were in real in, in person, in real life, like we would be networking, talking to each other before an event starts. So then I just put in my LinkedIn profile in the, the Zoom chat. And I was like, for all those attendees out there, if you want to stay in touch, like, please reach out to me and connect. And that's how I was connected to Bernice. So we scheduled a one-on-one -on -one and we connected right away. And like, I really admired her. I mean, she's a working mom for me, like my husband and I are family planning. So I'm like, that's already amazing to see her like have so many achievements as a working mom. She's a TEDx speaker and like she was just someone I was like, oh, I definitely want to be friends with her. And, and so like we we just got along. And once she asked me to be the co-founder, I didn't know what it entailed, but I was like, yes, we need a community for Asians in advertising. So it just happened. And we we've never met each other in person, but so definitely looking forward to that. Yeah. And I'm, I'm so you two have New not York. yet met each other. Right. You guys, you guys have just been on Zoom calls and phone internet calls. Internet friends. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> is in New York, um, and then I'm in Santa Monica, so we're you know on different oceans right now. But hopefully, yeah. Yeah. You guys need to post on on IG once you guys actually meet each other. I feel like it's going to be a <laughs> monumental event. <laughs> 
<laughs> so you guys mentioned it. Um, obviously, you guys are here because you, I mean, for a lot of different reasons, but you guys are the co-founders of Agents in Advertising. Um, I wanted to read the mission statement of AIA just because I think it's, it's a very powerful statement. Um, so Asians in advertising strives to develop a free community, create opportunities, and help elevate Asians to higher leadership positions, to make space for Asians within advertising, to come together in a community where we are often excluded, connecting with each other in order to advance goals, careers, artistic personal growth, help answer questions, offer advice, and have discussions about the issues that the Asian community faces as a whole or in creative careers. So that's, I mean, that's a very powerful state, statement. Can, can you guys tell us how you guys came about bringing that together? Yeah, I mean, we definitely wanted to first like create a community to connect everyone because there are Asians in advertising out there but there hasn't really been a community to connect everyone together. So that was the initial idea for us to have that community. And just even elevating the voices of our community is really important for us to amplify the voices and create opportunities for, for the Asians in this industry. Yeah, I mean, I think we recognize two big problems kind of within, and that's, you know, you're, you're kind of sometimes the token Asian, um, or, you know, you don't have a representation that you can kind of learn from. So that's part of the kind of the community building, right, to kind of meet other Asians. Um, you know, we talk about how important it is to kind of share kind of what you're going through or what tips you got to go there, or, you know, what's not okay, what is okay, you know, kind of those conversations. And then the other big issue is you, maybe you see a lot of agents that get hired in at the you know entry level because they maybe have the resume or the portfolio, but you don't see that many ladder up, right? Or grow to the C-suite or to a director or a manager level. And it's like, what happens you know, to all those agents that come in at the beginning and then they can't rise? Um, so you know, one of our main goals is to kind of give resources to help with that as well. Okay. Can you, can you guys talk a little bit about, about those resources and what you guys have been doing? Yeah, sure. absolutely. Okay. Yeah, Jocelyn, if you want to take that one. Yeah, so we, we have our first event the end of May where we have a, a matchmaking event and we are connecting people in the industry, agents and advertising together. And when Bernice and I initially talked about this idea, we thought maybe like, there would be 50 people in, like interested in it. And since, since we launched it in March, there's been over 600. So it's really great to see it. And that's why we created two events on May 27th and May 28th, where we'll have like breakout rooms and be able to have people network and just connect each other together. So that's, that's our first event. And then I'll let Bernice share about some other upcoming events we have as well. So then we have a second um, event that's the three-part leadership series so it's july 15th the 29th and august 12th and you know we're breaking this out into three kind of key moments in your career so kind of getting started in entry level so what does it look like getting that first job and then kind of the first five years how to kind of make that impactful and then leveling up your careers or second one so you know that mid-level to director manager you know how does that kind of progression happen and then lastly we have elevating into the c-suite so we identified some, you know, huge, you know, Asian Asians in our industry that are really killing it. Um, and they're going to be on a panel talking about how they got to the C-suite. So, you know, we really want to just, you know, show by example, you know, what it takes to get there um, and letting people ask those questions. Yeah, definitely. That, that I mean, that sounds that sounds so great. And would you say that, you know, it's been the, the, well, how, how are you guys getting the word out there about these about these events? So right now we've been organically posting on LinkedIn. Um, I I'm so blown away by kind of the reception of, or just kind of the critical mass of what LinkedIn can kind of get you. I think our very first introduction post, like I think my post alone got thirty thousand views um, for that matchmaking event, and I was just blown away. I was like, I had no idea there was so much interest and in how much sharing happened. Um, so yeah, no, it's been word of mouth. Amazing. Amazing. I, yeah, I mean, I think it's, I, I personally have not gone to this at all, but I think I'm, I'm definitely going to check it out. Cause, uh, I mean, I think it's, it's, it's just helpful. I mean, people are definitely seeking advice and 
it's it's obviously so much more helpful when it's someone that's come from the same background or or faces the same the same problems that 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 you face and um definitely looking into that and, and all that so you know shifting gears a little bit i i think you know it'd be kind of um i would say i want to say irresponsible it would, it would be a shame if we didn't bring up really the situation that's been happening with with the api community um in the last few months last year starting from covid um and all that how are, how are you guys dealing with with that situation I think for me, I've been really feeling myself in serving the community. So beyond Asians in advertising, that's also what even drove me to create our own Asian ERG within Omnicom and TBWA and what else I can do to really help with the community and be an advocate and create opportunities for them. And it's, it's great that I'm in a company that supports that because my managing director at TBWA, they saw that I was so active and sharing all these resources to my company. And he asked me to, to mention all these resources on a global town hall. So I was happy to do that. And they were just really supportive and learning what they need to know for how they can be an ally and how they can also just attend events and be part of the community. So it's I've been feeling myself in that way. And another example is Bernice and I were featured in a Think LA podcast episode. And when I shared it with our ERG, I was really happy to see that one of my colleagues responded back to me one on one to say that thank you for sharing your your episode like it really resonated with me and it's been helping me really reflect on how to amplify my voice a little bit more and hearing responses like that keeps me going to continue to help and think about ways where we can be part of the solution. Yeah, I mean, it's such so tragic. I mean, I don't you know, I don't think I actually really quantified like all the things that I've experienced right. firsthand or the microaggressions or, you know, even things that, you know, were probably a little bit like violence that, you know, I've just been been an API woman. Um, and I think like when all this kind of stuff happens and I'm reading the news, it definitely takes time for me to process. Um, I, you know, my work at RGA has been so great where they're just like, if you need to take the afternoon off, if you need to call off the meetings, definitely take some mental health, you know, time for yourself, um, kind of collect yourself. And to what Jessalyn said, um, kind of making that, what is the good part of that? Like, how do you turn that energy that makes you really sad into something really positive? Um, and that's been, you know, reaching out, you know, asking other people if they're okay, um, you know, supporting these causes, you know, whether that's donation or just reaching out and see if anyone needs help um, with their initiatives, I think has been really positive as well. I'm, I'm really just optimistic of all these groups of color coming together. Like, you know, just right. yeah. there's so many more ERGs kind of being formed around this, then it makes me so hopeful for the future um, that I'm, you know, I'm really optimistic that from all this kind of tragedy, something really great can happen. Yeah, yeah. Sorry, you want oh, I, was, I was I was going to ask and Bern, or add to that. Like Bernice was talking about mental health, so I even took a mental health day on March 16th, and I didn't hear about like the news about Atlanta until the next morning. And my boss checked in on me, like it was just like a Teams chat where she was like, "How are you?" And of course, my default response is, "I'm okay." Yeah. But then when I actually looked at the question, I started reflecting and. I think it's like I've been so busy serving the community, helping everyone. I honestly didn't make enough time to reflect, to check in on myself. So I started crying. And then I told my boss, I was like, actually, I'm not OK. Like, I just like just said I'm OK by default, but I'm not. And like she was like, take all the time you need. Like, let me know what support you need from our end. Like if you need to like, take the rest of the day off. So it's it was also just in, I was really grateful to have that kind of support in in my team and my current company because it means a lot to just know that they they see you and like they want to check in with you and not, they're not just looking at you of like make sure you get your work done they really care about the employee beyond the work that you do so I think that's really important to make sure to take those mental health days and we don't talk about it enough so I I wanted to like reiterate that that it is important and like I try to even vocalize it to the team like I even wrote a email to the entire agency to say like I took a mental health day and I encourage everyone else to as well. Yeah. And I think that's so important. Um, I mean, just post personally for myself, we're just bombarded by 
all this news. I think every single day you're on Net Shark, you're on, <laughs> you're following all these, uh, all these different social media, and and it's never good news. Uh, and it really makes you fear for not only yourself but your family. Like for my parents, I'm I'm scared for them to go out and go to the market or go to work or anything. And 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 I think it's definitely also ingrained in in me to to be a good son and to make sure that I show up for them. And that just gives me, it gives me so much, so much anxiety, but honestly, I don't really even know how to process it. I, I think Jessalyn, similar to you, if whenever anyone asks me if I'm okay, you know, I'm always like, I'm fine. I'm fine. This is, you know, I'll deal with it. But I think it's, it's also just, it's so important for people just to check in on each other because that actually just, it sometimes it snaps me out of it and say, you know what, this is a problem. And, I do need to deal with this and I don't need to go through my process of dealing with this. So I think that's sort of getting into uh, our next topic, topic, which is what are, what are ways that people could be allies to the API community? Yeah. I mean, I see this question from Anon that Bill put in the chat, um, you know, about microaggressions and, you know, I want to just make that kind of the first thing for allyship. Um, if you see your coworker saying something like that, oh, you know, ah, you look like so and so, or you know, kind of pointing out something that's you know, kind of offensive. Like I see, like, how do I get people to stop asking if I listen to K-pop? Um, you know, like, <laughs> they're not okay. And then if you hear someone else saying that to someone else, just stop them. Be like, hey, that's not cool. Or like, why would you say that? Um, or you know, if someone says it to you, just be like, no. Um, uh, last week, I was asked if my name was a chosen name or a given name, and my response was, I'm American, <laughs> I'm born here, um, so you make that judgment. Uh, but it was like one of those things where like people just don't realize what they're saying. Um, and I think so many times as Asians, we just kind of laugh it off and just be like, oh, it's okay, they said something really offensive, I'm just going to take it and just kind of shrug it off. I mean, just making sure they know that it's not okay to say those things, I think, is one thing we can do, um, whether that's for yourself or as an ally. Um, also reporting hate incidents. Uh, I believe that, you know, you can't make change if people don't realize there's a problem. So, you know, organizations like stopaapihate.org, um, they make it really easy for you to report that something's happening. <laughs> uh, or, you know, reaching back and pulling forward, you know, being available for mentorship. I feel like so often we don't see representation um, so if you're available, even if you're not at the top to kind of put yourself out there, um, I try to take in all the LinkedIn like messages I get for people to want to get coffee. I have it on my website as well. Um, also allyship and bystander training is another big thing. Um, Advancy Justice has a one hour course that's totally free um, that helps with anti-Asian and xenophobia harassment training. And then, you know, I have so many different ones. And then I also think educating yourself on the history. Uh, what, you know, a lot of people don't realize things like racism or hate has been happening and been happening in America for so long. Um, I'm still educating my family on this and my extended family because they just, they're like, I don't see a problem, right. you know, and they, ho they totally believe in the whole model minority thing and they think that's totally okay to be that. And I'm like, no, you know, there's a lot of reason why, you know, believing those things are holding us back or putting us against other races when we're saying things like we're the, a model minority and therefore like we're totally okay. Um, so I do think those are just some ways to kind of um, be an av ally for yourself, advocate for yourself or an ally. I I just wanted to call out one thing. I think when you're, uh, when Justin, when you're saying super mom, you know, Bernice is able to get through that entire thing with. with oh, I hope you hear that. If, you, if not, oh, no, it's fine. We have resources on our website, AsiansInAdvertising dot com. Uh, we have resources yeah. there, you know, including you know ways to support as well as well as ways to be an advocate. Yeah, for sure, and 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 we will be sending out all of these resources, uh, one canvas to to you guys. If you guys aren't able to get all that down, don't worry about it. Um, Jessen, do, do you have anything to add to that? I, I'm happy to share some resources, like actual way like companies can get involved and 
Because beyond being an ally, like companies can get involved by definitely not being silent about it. I mean, making sure that you're acknowledging the situation and talking about what's happening and even asking those communities, like if they want to get involved to share and I'll share it. Like even in my agency at TBWA, we've had the DEI leaders, they would check in with me to ask like, what, what, what do you think is a great resource to share? Or like, what should we do? And we've created like listening circles for our community to create those safe spaces for employees to be able to vocalize what they've been going through. And, and that's been really helpful or even creating like mentorship programs, whether it's internally or externally to support those API talent. And as Bernice was mentioning, like ed education is really important. So it's not only only leaning, instead of leaning on the underrepresented group to educate everyone else, make sure you're prioritizing, like there's always like a Google search to be able to educate yourself first and make sure you understand what you can do, whether it's reading a book, a podcast, or, or si definitely sign up for that bystander training that Bernice mentioned, because those are free resources that are out there and available for everyone. And, and also leveraging company ERGs. So that's something that it could be something that you create if your company doesn't have one or join your ER, company's ERG and see if you could be part of creating initiatives for your, your company. Can, can you tell us what a ERG is? Oh, absolutely. So uh, a ERG stands for employee resource group or some companies call it like a BRG, business resource group. And those are, for example, the Asian employee resource group that I have at TBWA, it's been a great community where we even tap into our three pillars for TBWA is culture, community, and career. And we're working on how to support the AAPI community on those three different pillars. And even, even if it's also collaborating with clients, we've collaborated with clients to see how can we make sure that there's representation when it comes to the campaigns or when it comes to career, make sure that there's career development opportunities intentionally for the API community as well. That's great. Thank you. Thank you guys for, for sharing. I think those are really great things for us to walk away with. Um, really quick before we sort of get to our last point, uh, I want to remind everyone that we're going to be doing Q&A session uh, very, very soon. So please, uh, was it Anon, Luke, I've seen that you guys have asked, asked some questions. If you guys please put those in, you know, so we can we can do our Q&A Q session. Um, you know, you guys have given us just a ton of, oh, <laughs> okay, sorry. Anon is anonymous, sorry. <laughs> That's not someone's actual name, sorry. <laughs> um, but going back, you guys have given us just a ton of information. So very, very helpful. If you guys, um, if you guys wanted to give us, you know, one take takeaway that people, um, you know, could walk away with this, with this, with what, what would that be? I'm happy to share. Like as a lifelong learner myself, and just being a advocate for learning every day, I, I want to remind everyone to make that time to educate yourself and take those actions to learn, even if it's starting off with like sharing a resource with, with your network or reading this article or just takeaways that you can apply. And it's important to really be a student of life. And there's, there's a quote by uh, Alvin Toffler that I wanted to share with everyone, where he says, the illiterate of the 21st century will not be those who cannot read and write, but those who cannot learn, unlearn, and relearn. And I think that's really important because there's a lot of, not only are we learning, but we also have to unlearn a lot of things that we were taught, whether it's growing up or from like what we've learned in the past and be able to learn every day. Like I, I say lifelong learner because like my husband and I are like, we're gonna learn until the day we die. Like every day is really important to be making sure we're, we're learning something new and, and for the better as well. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, we're going to get into our Q&A session. So I think some of these we, we've already mentioned, but let me let me scroll through this and see what we can bring up. Um, Luke asks, how do you walk the line between creating change in the workplace versus leaving when you feel uncomfortable? That's a great question. I, I can tap into that one because I have unfortunately experienced a lot of toxic work environments. And so I would say to answer that question, it's like really checking, checking if it's a healthy work environment to stay in. 
And there are red flags of that. Like if, and how do you walk between like creating the change is like, if you're speaking up and they're supporting the initiatives that you're doing or providing you resources, that's a place you want to stay in because they're supporting you to thrive and grow, which I'm fortunate to say that I'm in that place at TBWA. But in the past, when I decided to leave because it was really uncomfortable was when there was racism, when there was like verbal bullying or things like that. So there's a lot of red flags that you would need to look into and that would help make sure to professionally create your exit strategy for those kind of places. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I think it goes into so much of how much, how much can you see your company really supporting what, what you want to do mm-hmm. um, and for, for just sort of the betterment of everyone. Yeah. I, sure. I also see, I see the question where someone asked being raised as an AAPI to work silently, how are you able to put yourself out there? For example, posting accomplishments on LinkedIn. I, I wanted to call that one out because that's something I learned later on in my career, because I definitely am one of those people where I didn't grow up being the loudest in the room and I'm still not the loudest in the room and I'm okay with that. It's more just knowing when to speak up and knowing when to self-advocate for yourself. And I actually learned it from others. So being part of a lot of communities, I met someone in my network and I saw that they posted a lot on LinkedIn and they were posting like hashtag career development, career update. And I was like, and I noticed a lot of engagement, people commenting, people liking it. I was like, oh, that's interesting. I was like, and that actually is, seems like it would be fun to share career updates, whether it's an event you attended or a, something you um, learned. And I decided to give it a try and experiment it. So I tried to share updates on my LinkedIn and I saw the difference where you're, I'm one of those people that believe in like the law of attraction. You're really attracting more things of that into your life and you're able to create opportunities for yourself by posting that on your LinkedIn, like whether it's something you learn or like tagging the people, leaders that you're learning from and insights that you learn from them. And it, for, for people who want to try this, I will say that it's like a, a muscle that you really have to practice and try and you'll get used to it the more you practice it by like posting things whether it's an article or something small on LinkedIn or I even encourage everyone watching today to share like a little insight or takeaway from today's talk on what you would like to take away or apply immediately to whether it's your life or career. Yeah I mean so many times like people are reading your website and LinkedIn and that's how you get hired or that's how you get recommended for jobs. Um, They'll do that before they even talk to you. So, you know, there's a great uh, book called F being humble um, that you guys can check out, but yeah, put it out there. Um, I always tell people that are getting out of college or juniors or people looking for a job, like your website is the one place that no one's going to say that's not true. Like, I mean, like put it out there so people know that's what makes you special, what makes you unique, what makes you a great candidate to be hired. Um, you know, just because people are going to make judgments based on your name or what you look like or your picture, you know, this is where you can actually put your, you know, hard accomplishments down um, and make, give yourself a better chance. Yeah. Thank you. And I, I, th- I think specifically for, for the people of Canvas, you know, I think it's very easy to sometimes look at what you guys do every single day and be like, this is, you know, this isn't that important, important or in the grand scheme of these, does, does, does this really matter? But I don't think, I don't think we should look at it that way at all. I think, you know, really see the the worth and the value of what you're doing beyond what you're doing and, and be proud of that, you know, be proud of, of, of the things that you've learned of the things that you're doing, because, you know, even if you may not necessarily see the value in it, there there are people out there that that will see that value. So, I I mean, I we better be seeing a ton of Canvas people posting on LinkedIn after this. I'll, I'll say that. <laughs> we'll get to the next question. Uh, how have you gotten your company to put their money where their mouth is in terms of promoting AAPI? Work? I'm trying to, so I would say in terms of like what TBWA has been doing, they have also done donation matches, which has been really great to see that. And then we also within TBWA is within Omnicom, our parent company, they have also created an initiative called the three and five. And it's a really great DEI initiative to make sure that there's Asian representation. And it was a few months ago where there was a competition for for anyone to enter a PSA 
on how to change the industry and make sure that there's representations for Asians. And Admirasia was the winning concept. And now throughout the month of May, their PSA is running throughout like Times Square, the city and throughout the city. So it's really great to see that a lot of these leaders are looking to put change that's more sustainable rather than just like hiring an API leader and checking off the list. This is something of like, what can we do to change the, the norm? Because we want to make sure that the industry is serving us and representing us properly. So people, people can also read about it more on three and five, but that's one of the initiatives from Omnicom that I'm, I'm really happy and proud of to see that. Yeah, same with RGA. We created a whole um, Slack group called RGA Asians, um, where they bring in speakers, uh, panel speaker series, and then as well as you know what changes can you make in your career. So as a creative, you know we are often looking at people who are acting in our spots, directing our spots, producing our spots. Uh, you know, I think typically these have gone to a predominantly maybe white you know, centered like post-production, you know, looking for opportunities where you can kind of bring in more um, representation there will be a great place. Great. Um, so uh, the next question would be, how do you guys give space and make sure that API voices are heard without taking away from other minorities or vice versa? I will say there's room for everyone, and and I can even share the example at uh, TBWA where we we have a lot of our ERGs even collaborating with each other. Where there, for example, in June, not only is it Pride Month, but we're also actually having our Asian ERG, our our um, LGBT, and our Black ERG. We're planning to collaborate and do like some kind of fun like trivia night. And like, there's definitely ways to collaborate and be allies across all the different groups. So it's just a matter of creating those opportunities, even if it's the first time that you're creating it. And then I wanna share um, one of the reasons why I think Asians in Advertising was an idea that I wanted to kind of create a couple of years ago. And I was so scared of being exclusive that it didn't manifest. Cause I was like, you know, do Asians really need a space? I think, um, culturally, we're so, I, at least, you know, for me, I'm so wired to be like, oh, I don't want to offend other people. Um, you know, so as much as we're saying like, hey, you know, how can we work with other minorities? Also, you know, how can we help our own as well? Um, definitely working with other minorities is a great thing, but also needing, knowing that we also need a space as well. And our voices also need to be heard, I think is also another important kind of thing to say. Definitely. Yeah. I, I think it's it's so important to sort of have that have that distinction where both can be true. You know, we can both work very, very hard to make sure Asians are, are repre represented, but also make sure to include, you know, other minorities groups as well. Yes, definitely. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So on that point, do you ever run into issues with ERGs with prioritizing certain groups? I don't personally, um, I feel like there's room for us all, at least in my experience, I haven't seen a thing where it felt like one kind of squeezed the other one out. I feel like we all right. have room to thrive. And also, you know, other minorities are welcome in our ERGs. Like we are all allowed to visit the other ones. Um, so, you know, I've seen lots of voices come in, especially when all those, um, you know, kind of when the Georgia incident happened, a lot of people came into the Asians ERG that aren't Asians and wanted to talk about it as well. So I think having that open space is really great. Same, I have the same experience. Fortunately, when, especially now that I'm leading the ERG, there's been so many people across the different ERG leads reaching out and asking to collaborate. At first it was overwhelming because I'm like, wait, I need to create the foundation first and recruit some other co-leads. And then now as we're starting to create it, it's been amazing to see just all the allies that want to be part of it and brainstorm ways to collaborate. And we're even talking about how we can create some kind of ERG summit where we all all have sessions together, whether it's like a whole day event. So there's there's definitely a lot of great things happening. So we haven't had any issues on our end either. <laughs> That's great. That's great. Um, so Bernice, you 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 kind of touched upon this uh, in our earlier question. So what's your view on API representation in media or ads currently? What can we do about it? 
I think we just need to be proactive and mindful. I think so many times where, you know, your casting list gets shot down by your client or your creative director is like, I rather, you know, have this kind of person. Um, anytime where you're like, yeah, let's, you know, why don't we start considering this? Um, why don't we consider other diverse talent, you know, diverse talent or behind the lens or, you know, just like overall, I think as an industry, we could be better about being mindful about who we're hiring and who we're showing in our commercials. Um, I think growing up in America, I was like, I remember the two people that looked like me growing up, you know, it was like the yellow ranger and Margaret <laughs> Crow, like the two. And then there was like that one fly girl on living color. I'm totally dating myself here, but I like knew there was like three until I was like, you know, in college. Um, and I was like, you know, and I was like, that's so weird. Cause there's so many Asians and there's just like the three people on TV. Um, you know, and I think commercials are going to start getting better about that. I think now we're, being asked to kind of make sure that, you know, we're being represent representative of kind of who lives in this country. But I think the more that all of us can, you know, keep each other accountable. So if you're the account person on that, you're the media buyer, you're the strategy person, you know, these are, you guys all have a voice into saying who's on camera, who do we show, who are we working with? And also to add to that too, to not only have representation when it's May or when it's like a, a Asian holiday to make sure that it's sustainable throughout the year. So it's not just a check off the list to make sure we're covering it for like API month. It, it would be great to continue to see representation, just, just seeing like an Asian American in an ad just because if they're an Asian American and not because it's, it's related to their culture. Right. right. Also making sure that we're being, unbiased when we show Asians. Um, I've seen a couple scripts where I was like, kind of made me cringe, like, oh, we're gonna cast an Asian girl, she's gonna be in a boba shop. And you're like, why does she have to be in a boba shop? Um, or, oh, this is an Asian family, we have to have a rice cooker in it. I'm like, yeah, but you know, they're still American, you know, like we don't have to yeah. be stereotypical like of how we're showing Asians. Like we all don't have to seem like we're first generation Asians. Like, you know, there's so many different kinds of Asians out there. Um, and, you know, I just think we should definitely all be mindful of what we're putting in and, you know, what we're showing. Definitely. I feel like that that would actually do the opposite effect of, of what we're trying to do here. <laughs> Even though we, well, I love boba and rice, <laughs> but that's that, that that's just my personal preference. <laughs> um, so the next question is actually from our CEO, Paul. Um, so he's, he's saying, what are some tips to make the work we do for clients more representative and inclusive? I, I would say to make sure that you're including the different voices and in the room, like when it's like what Bernice was touching upon about like when it, you're planning the strategy or when you're talking about the creative. So it's not just your outcome of like having that representation in the ad, but also the planning process of it make sure that they're invited in the conversation early on and not as like an afterthought of like, oh wait, what do you think about this? We need it by tomorrow. Like make sure they're part of the planning, invited to it or invited into those client presentations to have representation there. And, and even, the, even in terms of like the recruiting diverse talent too, I would say to what's really important is to make sure you're retaining them and make sure that there are processes in place of making sure that they feel like they belong in the culture and the company. I also think right now, you know, one of the things that from, you know, us all being virtual, all our boxes are the same size. You're seeing everyone on the same screen. I think clients are more and more aware of who's in the room, uh, you know, on both sides. So I definitely think, you know, on the agency side, you know, and the client side, people want to bring diverse talent to the meetings because it's so much more obvious when they're not. It's not just the loudest person in the room and the person that's sitting closest to the client. Not mm -hmm. everyone has an equal playing field. You know, everyone on the Zoom call should be expected to talk now and everyone's video is the same size. So it's like definitely, you know, I think bringing the representation is definitely something that, you know, we're all kind of being asked to do now. That's great. That's a great point. I never thought of it like that. <laughs> Everyone's got an equal chance to speak up. Definitely. Um, yeah. Uh, last question. Where do you see Asians in advertising in the next few years? 
I mean, for me, I, you know, we're going to try to make this an ever growing thing, um, kind of meeting the community where it needs us most. Um, after all our, you know, events, we're having surveys of, you know, what was working, what do you want to see more of? Um, we hope that, you know, I feel like I don't know what everyone's going through or what, you know, everyone's looking for. Um, I definitely want to um, see what we can bring that makes it the most helpful, um, whether that's presentation skills, branding skills, um, more leadership conferences, more networking, whatever that may be. And, and for me, I would love to see, to continue to use Asians and advertising to help amplify the voices. I mean, for example, the leadership series that we have in the summer we're able to feature so many Asian leaders speaking on those three different events. And that's only the beginning. So it would be great, even people from Canvas Worldwide, if you wanna be speakers for our events, let us know, we'd be happy to collaborate. So we wanna to continue to have that visibility for the, the Asian community and continue to create initiatives just to make sure that we're providing those opportunities for us. Amazing. Thank you guys so much. Um, as mentioned before, they, uh, as Jessalyn and, and Bernice mentioned, they do have a few AIA events coming up, uh, matchmaking sessions uh, on Thursday, May 27th and Friday, May 28th, the Asian Leadership Speaker spe uh, Speakers, uh, Thursday, July 15th, Thursday, July 29th, Thursday, August 12th. We're going to be sending out uh, a link to to agents and advertising, so you guys can can look at those a little a little deeper. And I guess uh, they'll they'll need to register for it to, to join, right? Yes, I'm guessing. So. Hit the Zoom. Okay. So and make then sure you guys add us on LinkedIn. Um, if you want to talk to us, have virtual coffee with us, definitely reach out. We're always down to network and meet more people. Amazing. Amazing. Yeah. So we'll be sending all that out so you guys can have all this in an email wrapped up. Uh, but yes, we'd like to, you know, we'd really just like to th thank our guests for joining us and having such an inspirational talk. You know, I've personally learned so much from this discussion. Jessalyn, Bernice, thank you so much for what you're doing in the AAPI community. Um, thank you for having you know, us. Of course, of course. You know, we like to give a special th uh, uh, thank you to the DEI Council for putting this together. Uh, to Phil Chu working in the in the background, he he was really the orchestrator of all this. Um, and lastly, you know, we like to thank you guys all for joining. Uh, your support, your effort, your open mindedness, uh, your time continues to make Canvas a place where people feel safe and people feel heard. So thank you guys so much. Uh, and until next time, be safe, everyone. Thank you.